New Year from Quito, Ecuador. I'm Sweeney Gray and this is from the South, the Daily News Brief from Tell Us Your English. And we start this new edition right now. Every January 1st, Latin America and the Caribbean joins Cuba in its celebration of the anniversary of the revolution. 59 years ago, rebel army forces, headed by Fidel Castro, entered the city of Santiago de Cuba, victorious, marking the triumph of the Cuban revolution. Despite multiple aggressions by the U.S. government, under revolution, Cubans have achieved records of progress like universal health care, public education, and environmental protection. On this day, social organizations on the continent and the world over continue to be inspired by the Cuban Revolution and its legacy of anti-imperialism. As we celebrate the Cuban Revolution, we take a special look at Cuba-Caribbean relations. On December 8, 1972, four independent Caribbean countries established diplomatic relations with Cuba. They were Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. In recognition of that, CARICOM Cuba Day is celebrated annually. But Cuba has always supported the region by offering scholarships to CARICOM residents and life-saving health care to Caribbean heads of state. And Caribbean-Cuban relations continue to strengthen as Caribbean Airlines starts direct flights to Cuba starting January. Please allow me to communicate the appreciation and gratitude of the Cuban people and government for the expressions of solidarity received from our Caribbean brothers and sisters on the demise of the leader of the Cuban Revolution, Commander-in-Chief Fidel Castro Ruz. He was the pioneer, the leader, and the main promoter of political relations and cooperation among all of our countries. At this point, I would like to recall his words of December 8, 2002, when he said, the only way out for our peoples rests with integration and cooperation, not only among states, but also among the different regional mechanisms and organizations. In his New Year's message, Jamaica's Prime Minister, Andrew Holness, spoke of plans to reform the police service, the public service, and to continue with plans to strengthen the economy. But he was also very concerned with the social health of the country and is imploring his countrymen to be less violent. In 2018, we must do more to protect our women and children from violence. Indeed, we must all do more to reduce the level of violence and aggression we use in our daily life and social transactions, whether it is in disciplining our children, resolving a domestic dispute, resolving an intimate partner dispute, or simply the rage we express because someone stepped on our toe. Our acceptance of violence as a means of resolving conflict is taking away from the good-natured, loving, and hospitable people we are. It is threatening our civility and sensibilities and introducing a crassness which undervalues life. This year, I intend to lead a national campaign against violence in all its forms. During his New Year's message, Prime Minister Gaston Brown praised his countrymen for surviving a disaster for which there was no manual. For 2018, he says, among the many concerns is the restoration of normal life to the people of Barbuda. In the New Year, the opportunities for residents to return to Barbuda will be expanded and enhanced. My government will strive to make each of them more secure, more resilient, and more endowed to overcome any new challenges that climate change might bring. Barbudans, for the first time in recorded history, will be empowered with freehold title as absolute owners of land in Barbuda for a token consideration of $1. This will unlock the economic potential of the land that had laid fallow for centuries and will provide the citizens of Barbuda with, with significant economic opportunities, which hitherto they were denied. January 1st is a special day for Haiti because on that day, the nation led the way for Latin America's independence movements. 
On January 1, 1804, the African diaspora population faced the colonial powers, seeking their liberation. An abolitionist process began in 1791 with an armed confrontation between French colonizers and the black slaves who decided to rise up after being ravaged by a deeply inhumane system. In 2018, Haiti's President Jovenel Moyes will become the chairman of CARICOM. We bring you part of his New Year's message for the region. Twenty eighteen dawns for the Caribbean community with the prospect of seizing an opportunity out of a crisis. As we begin the rebuilding process after the devastating hurricanes of last September, as well as Hurricane Matthew, which pounded the region on October 3 and 4, 2016. We do so with the aim of creating the first climate resilient region in the world. The absolute necessity to create a climate smart region is clear given the effects of climate change, which have brought us droughts, mega hurricanes, heavy floods, and unusual weather patterns, all of which adversely affect our development. The social and economic gains that we have made individually and collectively must be protected against the onslaught of nature. The CARICOM member states, as well as the region's non-member states, production of greenhouse gases is practically null, even though they bear a disproportionate share of the consequences. In news of sports, the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee has named Misha Lee Ahi their Sportswoman of the Year. Ms. Lee Ahi is easily the top female sprinter in the country. The men's honor went to the 4x400 meters men's relay team at the World Championship in London because they shocked the world by snatching victory from the US and Britain to secure gold and were therefore guaranteed the TNT Sportsman of the Year title. Former Honduran President Manuel Zelaya has said that 2018 will be the year of liberation for the Honduran people. In a written statement posted to his Twitter account, the head of the opposition alliance invited everyone to continue to take up to the streets until the capitalist dictatorship of President Juan Orlando Hernandez has been defeated. In his message, Zelaya accused Hernandez of being the leader of an organized crime ring that is violating the Constitution and the laws of the Republic impoverishing the country and helping the rich accumulate more wealth while leaving the general population with inadequate health care and education. The Mexican National Liberation Zapatista Army has celebrated the 24th anniversary of coming out of hiding for the first time. The left-wing EZLN or Zapatistas recalled how their rebellion stunned Mexico and drew widespread support from leftists across the world with their message of indigenous rights and opposition to economic globalization. In 1994, they began their military occupation of Oaxaca State and another seven municipalities, claiming the autonomy of their communities and used their will to strengthen the resistance against the harassment and injustice enforced by the Mexican authorities. And we have more news in a minute, so stay with us. Welcome back. In his annual end of the year address, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro announced several new economic measures to continue the country's Bolivarian revolution. Maduro emphasized that despite the illegal economic war incited by U.S. President Donald Trump, the country has further, further advanced towards the model of 21st century socialism launched by former President Hugo Chavez. Among the measures he announced was a 40% raise in the minimum wage. I announced a 40% increase in the minimum national salary and all the salary charts at a national level for teachers, soldiers, police, doctors, public workers. But besides that, I am ordering an increase of 30 units to the food tickets. That would take it up to 61 food tickets. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos has sent a New Year's message to the country 
in which he said that 2017 was a year of transition in various aspects, but mostly because of the memorable peace accord with the FARC. El 2017 fue, decir, 2017 was a year of transition with positive and negative things that will help us in the new year, 2018, to keep moving forward into a better future for everyone. Peace, economic, social, and political transitions. A peace transition because we shift from signing the historic peace agreement with the FARC group, which ended the armed conflict, into the challenge of executing the agreement in order to construct peace. Those with the faces of President Pedro Pablo Kaczynski and former dictator Alberto Fujimori, who was recently pardoned, will burn as part of Peru's traditional New Year's Eve celebrations. Thousands have been protesting since Fujimori's pardon and are calling for Kaczynski to be held accountable for corruption charges in the Odebrecht scandal. Protests have not lost their fire over the holiday period and more demonstrations and calls for new elections are planned in the days and weeks ahead. A 20-year-old nightmare still haunts the victims of forced sterilization while the culprit, ex-Peruvian dictator Alberto Fujimori, walks free. We look back at the controversial reproductive health and family program of the 90s in this report. They were unaware and didn't understand what was happening to them when the medical staff came. The nurse said, you should be thankful that the Fujimori government has ordered this aid so that you stop giving careless births. A move which shook Peru, but the then president Alberto Fujimori claimed it was a necessary step to curb poverty and give freedom to women. This family planning method will make Peruvian women in charge of their own body. During the second term of Fujimori, between 1996 to 2000, he launched a reproductive health and family program. Under the program, about 300,000 women and 22,000 men were sterilized without their consent. At least 18 women lost their lives in botched of surgeries. The majority of the victims were indigenous people with low economic resources. As a part of his strategies to reduce poverty, Fujimori opted to reduce the births of the poorest families. I have a wound, a very deep one in my heart, losing a child and at the same time feeling that someone has taken the decision in your place to take away your right to be a mother, which is a natural right. That left a scar in me. Fujimori has been constantly accused of human rights violations and corruption during his tenure. And even though he was arrested for those charges in 2009, the issue of forced sterilization has been a heated topic in Peru's political arena. And the women of Peru has been fighting for justice and to have the right to decide when they want to have children and how many. The government, the state or the church won't help me raise my child. I will suffer with my child, and he or she will be a greater responsibility for me. That is why us women need the right to decide whether we bring a child to this world or not. Maria Isabella Sedano, who leads women's rights group DEMAS, has been fighting for women's rights in Peru and is a firm critic of the sterilization campaign of the 90s. Por los resultados that in a country, women are sterilized solely because it's thought that a woman cannot make decisions about her own sexuality or procreation, or that they are sterilized for being poor, or that they are sterilized because they are indigenous people and therefore ignorant. This is done with impunity, and many people justify it. As their fights go on, the pain of the victims of forced sterilization was renewed afresh when Alberto Fujimori was given a pardon last week. Their suffering could be addressed by moves towards justice and reparation, but for now, the action of the political elite are moving in the opposite direction. Staying in Peru, environmental organizations have condemned the lack of reparations up till now from the Dakar rally for damages caused in 2013. Furthermore, they condemn the fact that Peru will once again host this competition, placing archaeological and natural resources in serious danger. In 2012 and 2013, 
The Dhaka rally caused serious damage to the Nazca Line's geoglyphs, which have been declared by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. According to a report by the Maria Recha Foundation, the rally also damaged paleontological remains and archaeological areas, previously declared as protected sites. The destruction is really huge. You can, for example, look at the lines and on top of them you see endless tire trucks. How can you repair something like that? You can't. It's impossible. Even taking into account what the Paraka winds can clean up. According to the environmentalists, until this day, the government has not helped repair this destruction. Nonetheless, Peru will once again host this competition in 2018, ignoring the various reports that label the event as dangerous for the cultural patrimony and disastrous for the environment. It's disastrous because the area of the Ica Tablaso is in a way vital for bird migration. It's not just in Paracas, it's all along the coast. Paracas has a natural reserve and the bigger reserve is in Marcona. To be a part of the Dakar circuit, Peru paid the event's organizers the sum of $6 million. However, Peruvian authorities are not even aware of what role they will play in controlling the environmental impact. Does the government have any way of supervising what will be done or to oversee if 100% of the carbon footprint is being reversed? As Astros has explained, this is a social project by Asport, our company. So the government has no involvement and doesn't oversee anything? No. Dakar's 40th rally will take place from January 6th to the 20th and will traverse 9,000 kilometers between Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina. 525 vehicles will participate, including trucks, cars, and motorcycles. A situation that has caused outrage in Argentina is the decision of the Oral Federal Tribunal No. 6, which has granted house arrest to Miguel Osvaldo Echicolat, the former senior police officer during the dictatorship, who was found guilty of genocide, convicted for torture, and sentenced to 23 years in prison. Human rights organizations announced that they will work on a unified strategy so that the ruling can be reversed. In a move that sees a regression in the field of human rights and crimes against humanity, the genocide condemned across three consecutive cases, Etse Colats, Circuito Camps, and La Cacha, Etse Colats will now be able to fulfill his sentences in his house in the Mar del Plata city, province of Buenos Aires. The truth is that a decision of a sector of justice is retreating. It is denying the process of truth and justice, and that is really giving up on a process of justice against genocides in Argentina. The grandmothers have already said so. Human rights organizations will take actions to avoid this house arrest. The judicial decision has caused distress for the family of Jorge Julio Lopez, the construction worker who disappeared in 2006 and was the key witness in the cases against the head of the Buenos Aires police, who was responsible for 21 clandestine detention centers. It really is a genocide. He is the murderer responsible for multiple crimes. While he was following the judicial process, we haven't forget the disappearance of Julio Lopez. We don't forgive it. Echecolas is one of the worst examples of Argentina's genocide, of human rights violation, and that is why we continue demanding jail for him, not house arrest. Currently, there are a number of open charges. The representative was also condemned in another three cases related to a disappeared person and other crimes against humanity. During the year, we had to come out many times to say that what we had conquered in all of these many years of struggle of the grandmothers, of their families, can be go back on, like in the case of the attempt of the two-for-one court. The frustration and the pain when we found out that someone who committed genocide was returning to his house, I am talking about Echocolats, who finally has recovered his freedom, despite all of us and despite of what justice was supposed to do. The rejection is unanimous. The children and families affected are filled with anger and pain. In declarations to the press, they warn that with this order, they feel horrors sent once again in their neighborhoods. Amnesty for mass murderers as a true nightmare.
Human rights and organizations and family members denounce that this event shows the double standards of the Argentina's justice that persecutes and incarcerates social and opposition leaders against the current government, but at the same time gives freedom to those responsible for genocide. And we'll be back very soon, so stay with us. Welcome back. Israel has indicted Ahed Tamimi, the 16-year-old Palestinian girl who hit an Israeli soldier in the face outside her home in the village of Nabi Sela in the occupied West Bank. Twelve charges are being brought against her, including court counts of aggravated assault against a soldier who the army said was bruised on his brow by her punch. Other charges include obstructing a soldier in the performance of his duty and throwing stones at troops. At her hearing in a military courtroom in Ofer Prison near Ramallah, Prosecutors ask she be held in custody until the end of her trial. The viral video and her subsequent arrest has sparked worldwide protests calling for her release. Because there are so many charges and there is evidence that they collected only after her arrest, we will request uh, several days in order to, to copy the evidence, to, to obtain the evidence that they have and uh, study it and then try to release her uh, later on. Israeli's conservative Likud party has passed a non-binding resolution urging legislators to effectively annex Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank, land that Palestinians want for a future state. Meanwhile, protests across Palestine continue since Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Our correspondent, Noah Harazin, has more details in this report. While the whole world is celebrating a new year, Palestinians here, especially in the Gaza Strip, are celebrating by more casualties arriving to the hospitals of Gaza and the West Bank. Clashes erupted between Palestinian youth and Israeli forces in different cities in the West Bank. Same thing happened here in the Gaza Strip, close to the uh, northern borderline between Gaza and Israel and also to the eastern borderline between Gaza and Israel. This wave of violence started almost three weeks ago when U.S. President uh, Donald Trump decided to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And since then, Palestinians have been organizing protests, rallies, and clashing with uh, Israeli forces face-to-face. -face. Youth groups on social media, Facebook and Twitter, have been asking more Palestinians to head to the streets and express their rage and anger. Harazin for that report. Twelve people have been killed and hundreds arrested in nationwide protests in Iran that have now entered their fifth day. What began as demonstrations against unemployment and rising food prices turned into anti-government protests calling for a change in leadership. Iranian state TV said that some armed protesters had tried to take control of some police stations and military bases and that police retaliated with tear gas and water cannons to disperse crowds. Pro-government demonstrators also took to the streets in huge numbers in support of the ruling President Rouhani and the clerical establishment. The annual pro-government rally in Tehran, which has been held since pro-reform unrest in 2009, was bolstered by the current unrest, with protesters calling for calm and unity in the face of economic instability. U.S. President Donald Trump tweeted his support for the protests on Sunday, from his private club in Palm Beach, Florida. Israeli President Netanyahu made a televised statement to wish the protesters success while dismissing claims that Israel was behind the demonstrations. Trump's tweet reads, Big protests in Iran. People are finally getting wise to how their money and wealth is being stolen and squandered on terrorism. Looks like they won't take it any longer. The USA is watching very closely for human rights violations. In reaction, President Rouhani rebuffed Trump's statements, saying that the U.S. president had no right to sympathize with Iranians since he, just a few months ago, called the Iranian nation a terrorist nation. In This man in America who today wants to sympathize with our people 
has forgotten that just a few months ago, call it the Iranian nation a terrorist nation, label it a terrorist nation. This person who is against the Iranian nation to his core, he wants to feel sorry for Iranians? There's a question here. It is an open discussion. Hong Kong's annual demonstration saw around 10,000 citizens march through the city demanding a stop to any further erosion of its autonomy, holding various banners that read protect Hong Kong and defend one country, two systems, protesters expressed worried at encroaching suppression by Beijing. Semi-autonomous Hong Kong has been ruled under a one country, two systems deal since Britain returned it to China in 1997. Some scuffles with police broke out during the protests. At least eight people have been killed after a boat carrying 48 passengers sank off Indonesia's Kalimantan Island. Another 13 passengers, including some children, remain missing. The boat was on its way from Tangjung Silo to Tarakan on the Indonesian side of Borneo Island when it overturned and sank. Witnesses filmed the rescue operation with survivors being brought to shore. It's been nine years since 22-year-old Oscar Grant was killed by transport police at a station in Oakland on New Year's Eve. The killing of Grant by a white police officer sparked rioting and led to an increase in racial tensions in the city of Oakland. Footage filmed by passengers on the train station appeared to show Grant sitting calmly on the platform shortly before the scuffle that left him dead. Pope Francis celebrated the New Year conducting a solemn mass in St. Peter's Basilica on Monday. The leader of the world's Roman Catholics asked the faithful to keep freedom from being corroded by the banality of consumerism. To set aside a moment of silence each day to be with God is to keep our soul. It is to keep our freedom from being corroded by the banality of consumerism the blare of commercials, the stream of empty words and the overpowering waves of empty chatter and loud shouting. People gathered on the beach in Concepcion Bamba in the Mexican state of Oaxaca on December 28th to release new hatchlings of endangered olive ridley turtles back into the wild. Hundreds and thousands of olive ridley turtles usually land on Oaxaca's Pacific beaches as part of an annual egg-laying migration. As the time came to release the turtles, local families gathered to place the young turtles on the sand and then watched as they trudged into the sea. The purpose of such mass release events is to create an awareness of the local turtle population. <laughs> We have released 2,300 turtles with today's release. Up to today, that's 2,300 turtles. We always release them at night, in the afternoon, normally later than today, so the birds and everything have gone, and people have come all these days. I released her to the sea. She went to the sea. She went to her house with her family. We've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, telesiostv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I am Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching.